My special guest today is Jeff Shiwi. Jeff is a fine art photographer, a digital artist, and a world-renowned Photoshop expert. He is known in the industry as a digital pioneer and has been a long-term alpha and beta tester for Photoshop, Camera Raw, and Lightroom. Get your coffee ready. Here is my unedited conversation with Jeff Shiri. Enjoy. Jeff, nice to nice to have you here on, on, on Frames. Uh, uh, such a great guest you are. So uh, you know, I'm so happy to have you here. Um, um, how are you doing today? Uh, well, it's early in the morning for me, <clears throat> Chicago time. It's uh, 9.35. So aside from the fact that I've not had my n- normal intake of coffee, I'm doing pretty good, Tomas. Nice, nice, nice. So, oh, yeah, I see coffee is there, so everything is under control, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you know, there is so many things I would like to talk to you about. Uh, uh, let, let's see how a conversation well, goes. I got nothing else to do in the morning. <laughs> You you have you have you have done it all. You have you know. Um, I will let you talk just in a minute. But you know, uh, from what I know, you started as a painter, right? Uh, uh, you know, then then you switched at some point to photography. You were a drawn. frustrated painter. Well, we yeah, get to this no, one. I yeah. mean, no, that makes a difference because I wanted to become a famous painter, but the problem was that I couldn't draw worse shit. So. That's what led me actually into photography because uh-huh. that way I could paint with light and I didn't have to draw. So did you actually paint for, for like a oh, yeah. couple of years or oh, yeah. how, how yeah. long was this period? Well, I, my mother uh, sent me to Springfield Art Association every Saturday starting from when I was like nine or ten. in the uh, So... I would go to art class uh, every Saturday for a long time and <clears throat> took painting and sculpting and uh, uh, c- ceramics. The sculpting part did kick in with me and played a role later in in my career when I did, uh, before digital imaging, I would do model making. I would make the model and then photograph it. Uh, so the art background, I think, was... Mm. Uh, a really critical component of my, um, uh, shall I say, uh, early years. W- when did you discover photography? When, like, which year was it? Which which year? Uh, are you about? I don't know. I vaguely remember going to a trip to Florida and my mother giving me a a, a brownie camera and uh, telling me, go off and take photographs. And I, I was taking artistic photographs. I mean, it's a brownie, a box camera. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was taking artistic photographs, and I thought that was fun. Um, but uh, I got yelled at by my father because I shot up like three or four rolls of film. And back in the old days, um, uh, you know, before digital uh, it uh, film and processing cost a lot of money, so I got yelled at. And uh, <laughs> but it was not really until college that I got into, uh, shall I say, black and white photography, mm-hmm. um, where I would process the film. And in fact, I sent you some uh, early history photographs. I, I, I have one roll of film. But I got one section of film. I can't find the whole roll <clears throat> of the first roll of black and white film that I processed. It's all stretched to shit. It's horrible. And, you know, I could, I could use Photoshop and fix it, but mm-hmm. there's something interesting about all the scratches and the dust and everything. So I got into, uh, photography in college and I ultimately got into deciding to get into commercial photography. Uh, because at the time I was taking a theater class, uh, and this was at Illinois State, and it had a pretty decent theater program. Uh, and I was taking a theater class, not acting. I was uh, doing uh, stage direction, and the instructor asked if anybody had a really ca- a good camera. 
so that I could shoot a uh, uh, mm-hmm. rehearsal. And I, I volunteered and, and I got to sit up in the balcony with uh, my little Canon 35 millimeter camera and tell everybody what to do. And I thought that, oh, this is great fun. And concurrently, I was in art class in uh, Illinois State and uh, basically a frustrated painter. Uh, you asked me about painting. I, yes, I like painting. I liked. Uh, I didn't like drawing because it's uh, it it's hard work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you're going to do an accurate rendering, you know, a two dimensional mm-hmm. rendering of a three dimensional scene, you got to do shading and all that stuff was just a lot of work. So sitting up on the balcony and telling the uh, uh, all the actors and the lighting director what to do, and, and I thought that was great fun. So, so it seems like, you know, the, the, this fascination for, for visuals, you know, for what capturing what's in front of you, it, it has been, you know, inside you for, for, you know, forever. I mean, painting first and transitioning into photography. When you discovered, you know, when you, when you held, held this camera for the very first time in your hands and, you know, started photographing, was it like a natural progression for you? Uh, something that you were immediately, you know, fascinated with after this painting phase? What, how was this moment for you? What was so different? Um, well, the photography part, uh, I have to be honest, it wasn't so much the taking of the image, but the making of the image in the darkroom. Um, the, uh, you know, um, putting the negative in the enlarger and working in a safe light. I mean, you've done this, right? Um, uh, a lot of us old gray beards, although you don't have a gray beard, I see some gray in your hair. So <laughs> it's coming. You, yeah. <laughs> you, you got into photography in the analog days in the, well, the I was just, I touched on it like briefly. Yeah. It was very quickly. I was into digital, you know, so, but the, the, the thing about it is the fascination really was working in the dark room where you start with a blank pink, a piece of paper, put it in the developer. And this image would appear. I found that fascinating. Uh, and so that's what uh, really got me into photography was the um, the darkroom side, the black and white side, mm-hmm. which now it's interesting because full circle, uh, some of my more recent successes in photography has been uh, black and white. And recently, I had a editorial series accepted in communication arts uh, here in in, uh, in the U.S. I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with CA, um, but it was um, uh, a series of, uh, um, although digital black and white, not analog, uh, but a series of uh, black and white images from Antarctica. I've had the... Uh, Good benefit. Uh, the, I've had the uh, uh, benefit of being able to go down to Antarctica three times. But what ended up happening was uh, during the pandemic, I didn't travel, I didn't go anywhere, I didn't see anybody. So I sat around in my uh, studio going through my old stuff. And Antarctica is an interesting place in that the uh, lighting is not always conducive for color but it sometimes is really conducive to black and white. And so I went through and I've, I've, I've got some examples that you can see of uh, uh, black and white in Antarctica. And, and so that's been a success for me. Uh, but yeah, it really was the black and white that got me hooked uh, and analog, not digital. Mm-hmm. Although I stepped into the digital realm pretty early in my commercial career. So what ended up happening is that I ended up falling in love, getting married. Uh, in I've been married since I was 19 years old. Uh, at the end of August, I don't know when this will air, but August 31st, I'll be in Portofino, Italy, um, taking my wife out to a Michelin-starred restaurant for our 50th wedding anniversary. Oh, wonderful. Congrats. Yeah. It's just uh, around the corner from where, where I am, you know, Switzerland, Italy is just, you yes. know, uh, so, um, yeah, like you, yeah, like you mentioned already, then, you know, then 
digital photography came along and I can see this fascination of you first being in the, in the dark room, right? And, and, um, enjoying working on the images post factum, you know, yeah. uh, in the dark room. So then comes yeah. digital dark room and you are embracing all of those, you know, um, new technologies, the software you start working with, with different companies, uh, including Adobe, you know, from almost from the very beginning, as I understand, you were on board, you know, working with them, advising them, you know, uh, on, on Photoshop, Lightroom, and so yeah. on and so forth, right? Be, being, being, uh, uh, I, my unofficial job title was um, Royal Pain in the Ass. <laughs> uh, because, <Beep. laughs> well, what, they, bleep. <laughs> Beep. <laughs> okay, arse. How's that? Arse? <laughs> That's better, yeah. <laughs> Um, the English version. Uh, no, I mean, I would, they would ask my opinion on stuff and I would tell them unfiltered and, um, and then it would be like, oh shit. Well, then they, uh, then they, uh, well, it got to the point where they actually started relying upon me in early development. Uh, I was the first, uh, offsite alpha tester, as far as I know working on Photoshop 4.0, not CS4, 4.0. 4.0, I, I, I dig in a bit. Was it around 96, 1996 or something like this? Yeah, very yeah. good. Okay. okay, so crazy. I mean, you, you know, you knew this software, right? Inside out from the very beginning, you were, you were working with them and, you know, working on features, suggesting features. Uh, is Photoshop today, you know, even remotely, you know, somewhere close to what you were imagining it back then to, to develop and, and the place to get to? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> so back in, uh, now my first version of Photoshop was 2.0. Um, I did not start using it in 1.0. Although Thomas, Noel, uh, the guy that wrote Photoshop, mm -hmm. I have a uh, Mac G4 that can run System 9, and I can actually boot up uh, Photoshop 1.0. Uh, wow, okay. <laughs> and what was funny is I went over to Ann Arbor and did a, a workshop with Thomas, uh, not teaching him, mm -hmm. um, basically co-teaching with him. Uh, but we were, I did a Photoshop demo and this was in the mid 2000s. I did a Photoshop demo running Photoshop 1.0. And Thomas looked at me afterwards. He said, you know, I've never seen Photoshop one run so fast. But <laughs> what you have to understand is in the old days, in the old days, um, Photoshop was, well, first of all, it would crash all the time. So, you would do something in Photoshop and then you would hit command S save. Sorry. Yep. It command. Still remember doing it. I think oh, yeah, yeah. With, the, yeah. with the later versions. <laughs> so anything, anything that you did that was important, you wanted to save right away and often save versions because you weren't mm -hmm. necessarily sure. Uh, and, and so the versions, that's something that came up again later in Lightroom. Uh, being able to do snapshots and stuff. So what ended up happening was that um, now I was pushing the envelope early because I was a photographer and I wanted to work on as near film resolution as possible. And um, that takes a pretty powerful machine. Um, I remember I used to run Unsharp Mask and it used to take 15, 20 minutes to run on a full image. Mm -hmm. um, and then as soon as it was done, I would save. So it, if it crashed, I wouldn't lose the work. Mm -hmm. um, but what ended up happening was that early on, um, uh, one of the Photoshop engineers, basically when he was working on Photoshop 3, um, and doing memory management, uh, he, we used to get together at, on AOL, um, the Photoshop chat Tuesday nights on AOL, uh, and Thomas Knoll and his brother John, uh, a bunch of early Photoshop adopters out on the West Coast, uh, and, and myself, I, for some reason, found 
the Photoshop chat, and um, it was organized by Kai Krauss. Do you remember who Kai Krauss was? No, no. I KPT, don't. Kai's Power Tools, mm, okay. uh, an early Photoshop plugin developer, uh, and um, uh, also ended up uh, creating a company called uh, Meta Creations and a, a software called Live Picture. Did you ever hear of Live Picture? I think the, the name yeah. maybe rings I mean, the bell, it, but not to... <laughs> Yeah, ancient history. Yeah. Uh, but what ended up happening is we would get together on Tuesday nights and you'd have to get in there early because it was so popular that the rooms would get filled up. Uh, but Mark Habberg found out that I was working on 48 megabyte uh, images, 48 megabyte Tomash. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was huge. Of course, now my images are into the gigabytes. Um, so anyway, uh, um, I was able to discover some bugs and document it. Uh, and that's how I developed a relationship of um, learning how to work with engineers. I don't code. I wish I did, yeah, but uh, kind of uh, like uh -huh. I can't draw and I can't code. Mm -hmm. um, but what no. I can do is work the the images in post production. Yeah. Now you know I, I I went through your portfolio you know online and we'll be sharing all the links and also images on the video here. So uh, and I can see that you yourself and you know also other other the others you know writing about you or maybe interviewing you refer offer to your work as as a, mm, as digital imaging. Yeah. So let's talk about this differentiation here. And where are you drawing the line? You are a photographer, but then also with time, you know, Photoshop, all those software pieces, they keep adding tools, which allow us to, to, you know, m m modify our images, to work on them, to add elements, you know, change colors, you know, cut them in pieces, whatever. So you as a photographer, you know, inside and then working with those ongoingly, you know, developing tools of and how and exactly getting into digital imaging. Where is the line for you? What does it mean? Where is the boundary between those two medium kind of? Uh, so how far is too far? <laughs> well, no, just just, you know, your take on this all like uh, are, are you a photographer? You calling yourself a photographer today? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I used to be a um, advertising photographer. Now I call myself a fine art photographer. Um, and that's been a very interesting uh, progression. Uh, but no, I uh, since the image starts as a photograph, and whether or not it is composited or otherwise manipulated, um, back when I first got into commercial advertising photography and started doing this commercially for clients, uh, the first image that I had put together, two different images, was uh, in 1984. So this is a long time ago, precursor to Photoshop. In fact, Photoshop was just a gleam in Thomas's eye uh, until 1987. But uh, I took two 8x10 transparencies and sent them off to a lady down in Houston, Digital Transparencies, Inc. Her name was Raphael. And uh, over the course of 10 days, two weeks, um, they, they basically took the two images, scanned them, and not even using Photoshop, but using custom um, uh, coded algorithms, put the two images together, and then sent me back an 11 by 14 transparency. Now, starting with 8x10, ended up with 11x14. I put a loop on that, uh, and I couldn't see the digital imaging. I couldn't see where, I mean, the, the assembly was seamless. Mm -hmm. So what I decided at that point, now I had done multi-image combinations in camera at school. We had a little flapper that would fit inside of a view camera. You'd put an 8x10 transparency or 4x5 transparency on it, you would do a scene of still life, front lit, with the, the transparency flipped up, and then you would flip it down, you turn off the front light, turn on the back light, and you would do a second exposure 
letting the background come through mm -hmm. so that basically you did a two shot combination in camera. Uh, also multi uh, exposure. I, I, I love transparency sandwiching, uh, taking two or, or three, <laughs> two or three underexposed or overexposed transparencies and putting them together. And then also multi exposures. One of my early, f uh, f uh, favorite influences was Jerry Ulsman. Um, and I had the benefit of actually getting to know Jerry. I got to visit his darkroom down in Gainesville, Florida. But I really loved what he would do is to create surreal scenes out of real photographs. So my whole thing is to do uh, whether it's one, two, or many um, different combinations, I would put them all together. But all of the images, all of the pixels were mine. And that's something that is a hard to find line. Back in the old days, I was doing it basically because I was working with clients and I wanted to do all of the photography, not just parts of it. Also, there's in the United States, there's a thing called derivative rights, mm -hmm. where I could take somebody else's photograph and combine it with mine if I had the right to do so from them. But then I would basically not own the resulting composite uh, copyright in totality. It would be, I, my copyright would be dependent upon the licensed copyright of the other image. So I just, I got to the point where I did not want to use other people's photographs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in my composite. So uh, basically everything, um, uh, they're all my pixels, Yeah. which actually is, is my feeling today about generative fill and the whole AI uh, explosion that um, I, perfectly fine if you want to do that kind of stuff. Uh, some people like to paint uh, in Photoshop, you know, literally paint. I can't paint, so I mm -hmm. can't draw. Uh, some people like to do straight photography, absolutely no modifications that could not be done, uh, like in the darkroom. Uh, and um, and other people uh, like to use, you know, AI to create surreal, non-real images. The thing about the AI... I mean, I've been doing this since 1984, so this does not surprise me. But apparently it has shocked the world that AI, now we used to call it CGI, computer generated images. That's the, that's how Photoshop mm -hmm. started. John Knoll asked his brother Thomas to help him, uh, basically take, uh, film, uh, images from one proprietary computer system into another. And so he needed to make adjustments of gamma and curves. And, and so that's how Photoshop started was as a graphics utility program. Um, but, um, so the whole CGI, you know, Hollywood, mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, Star Wars. So basically Photoshop is a, uh, stepchild of of uh, of of Star Wars, mm -hmm. so that, but that's the line that I like to draw. The my work is my pixels. So yes, I do call myself a photographer. Uh, yeah, I think you mentioned it, it sh it's currently you know shocking the world. Uh, uh, it, it is shocking for me. Personally, also not so shocking. I have been into computers, into software for years. You know, my parents are both computer programmers. It's technology. I think what, what, what disturbs, you know, in a way, or maybe doesn't fit the image, you know, for many people is the fact that, that the software called Photoshop, which has a photo, photography, you know, a, a word in it, in the name, you know, now contains those generative tools and, uh, the, the, the line in the software itself becomes kind of blurry, but I think what you described before is it's actually it uh, it's very close to the approach we are we are having here at Frames. You know that um, the image you know can be consisting exactly of you know thousand pieces or maybe you know mixed as a collage or whatever mosaic whatever it might be. But if all of those pieces 
were originally images which I took with my own camera, you know, looking through the viewfinder, it's still kind of, uh, it still remains in the photography realm, right? But, you know, once you start, of course, introducing those external artificially generated uh, elements, th that's where the discussions start now. And that's why what's kind of <laughs> difficult for, for people to embrace, right? Well, for, for the purists, for, for photographers. You and I had a, um, uh, um, a, uh, comment exchange on, on Facebook. The, the thing, and I have no problem with drawing lines in the sand. Uh, if Frames does not want AI-generated images as editor-in-chief and, uh, it, you know, um, it's your prerogative to define what is and isn't acceptable. Um, uh, uh, I had an interview not too long ago with a fellow by the name of Matt Payne, uh, who is one of the guys that started the Natural Landscape Awards, uh, which f finally I remembered to actually enter this year. So we'll see how my uh, landscape work. Uh, Fingers um, crossed. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, while some of the stuff that I entered, uh, some of the stuff I didn't enter, I could have, but it was composited. So I put in a new sky, I did some, but it was my sky. Uh, you know, I didn't use somebody else's sky. But his line in the sand is that they have very strict rules about what is and isn't uh, digital manipulation that is acceptable. And I'm fine with that. And I mm -hmm. think that as long as everybody is clear um, what the rules are and that everybody agrees to work within those rules, then that's fine. For journalism, uh, you know, it's a very hard, fast rule. Um, if you're doing biomed or documentation or industrial photography, uh, yeah, you know, if you're a, uh, a scientist and you fudge the work in Photoshop, you get into trouble. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you're a journalist and you create an image out of composites that didn't actually happen in the first place, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you, Matt it, started the Natural Landscape Awards because of the the whole hipstamatic crowd, the Instagram look of of fake landscapes. And, you know, you see them all the time. They're, they, they can be beautiful images, but um, as a photographer, I can look at something and say, well, that's not real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, wait, this is a great moment. Uh, let me share it here with you. I will share the screen and I will later embed it in a different way into the video. But uh, I want to ask you about this particular series of your images. <laughs> right? <laughs> here we go. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because uh, I, I, you mentioned hipstamatic. I, did, I, I knew hipstamatic, of course, for, for years. I, you know, used it you know, I don't know, seven years ago and then forgot about it. And recently I kind of rediscovered it and I, and I kept enjoying it. Like you here with those, I don't know if you use Hipstamatic here or a different software, but, you know, reproducing this old look of, of, um, of tin types, of tin types and, so, and so on. What is it? What is it, you know, that, that um, causes the, those fascinations, you know, in us and... Uh, so, how would you describe th th this this particular series of yours, and uh, you know, in, in in the light of what we have just discussed before, you know? So, um, so, this was actually done started with an app called Tintype, which is from Hipsmatic, uh, and what ended up happening is my wife and I. My birthday is February twenty second we decided uh, to go someplace warm. And I looked at the average daily temperature on February 22nd of Tucson, Arizona and St. Augustine, Florida. Turns out that Tucson, Arizona's temperature on February 22nd was like two degrees warmer than St. Augustine. So we went to uh, Tucson and of course on my birthday it snowed. Um, so it was not warm. We didn't go swimming. Uh, and you can see snow on the cactus, which mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I found photographically interesting. But I started photographing this stuff with my iPhone because I didn't even bother to drag my uh, uh, Nikon out. Um, and 
I started playing with this app called Tintype. Now, so it the genesis was to use the Tintype app, but then of course I got hooked, and I've got 14 gigabytes worth of texture. <laughs> When I go out and see texture, I'll shoot texture mm -hmm. just so that I can add it. And, uh, you know, I spent 25 plus years trying to make the perfect photograph. So now what I like to do is to go out and really screw up a photograph. So adding texture, scratches, rough edges, um, you know, this is all... So Kind of, the, the, this kind of images would not be accepted in the uh, competition you just mentioned, right? In the contest landscape. I don't think so. No. Okay. No. Uh huh. Yeah, that, that's it. that's for me this this moment. You know, I I'm, I mean, I am enjoying it and I'm struggling with it at the same time myself, right? I, you know, I, I like to call myself photographer when I start working hipstamatic on you know completely changing digitally changing the look of of you know of the capture. I, you know, I, I, I don't have answers here myself, you know, I don't know if it's still fine or, or you know, I will be facing a, you know, a, a, a crazy critique, you know, from fellow photographers. But at the same time, I'm enjoying the process of experimenting with this kind of tools. Yes. And so. as long as it fits within the... So here's the thing that everybody has to decide for themselves is... Where do you set your own boundaries? What is and isn't acceptable to you? And, uh, you know, I've, I've had a friend uh, that basically, I'm, I'm, you know, a pixel wrangler. I haven't mm -hmm. met a photo that I haven't wanted to manipulate. Um, but uh, I manipulate the photo. I don't create the photo out of words or... Um, you know, waving my hand with a magic mm -hmm. wand. So, uh, uh, and like I said, I have a very clear delineation of what I do or, and don't want to do. The, all of the cactus tin type images started out as real images on an iPhone. Um, not even a real camera like a Nikon. It's just an iPhone. Um, and, and the interesting thing about iPhone is that there are a lot of photographers that look askance at iPhones, mobile photography. You know, mm -hmm. that's not mm -hmm. real photography. Mm -hmm. Well, it is if you want it to be. Um, and so, you know, photography can be whatever you want it to be for your own uh, purpose and gratification. Uh, now, I, I call myself a fine art photographer. I don't call myself an artist. I'm artistic but I'm not necessarily an artist. I wish I was an artist. I wish I could paint. I wish I could, uh, you know, um, do stuff that I can't do. So I do the stuff that I can do. Um, and uh, so I think that... So are you saying a photographer is not an artist or it's just in your case? Or what do you exactly mean? Well, I, I'm a photo artist. I'm an artist with a camera. But I'm not a painter uh, or a drawer. Mm -hmm. um, the, the the funny thing, of course, is that when I first got into photography, um, I was frustrated that I couldn't draw. Um, and, of course, at the time, I didn't know there was such a thing called an art director. Uh, art director is, uh, you know, they don't have to draw. They can do stick figure layouts and stuff. Um, but um, so, yeah, you know, yeah, I, I'm a photo artist. I'm an mm -hmm. imaging artist, but I the term artist by itself is a little bit overly broad for what I do. I think you know, but okay, but with, with uh, whatever kind of imagery you are, you know, working on it and doing yourself, you you are thinking about the viewer consciously or unconsciously. There is a final, you know, destination is the viewer's eyes. Uh, what, what would you say you you're trying to achieve, or are you trying to achieve anything? You know, when because I, I you are obviously showing your images to the public, to yeah. through the contest on the website. Uh, print, you're printing a lot, right? Yep. And exhibiting probably, right? So, yep. what what what's the final, you know, wish or dream when it comes to the reaction of the viewer? Um, 
In fact, uh, I had this, uh, I had a, a portfolio review with a guy by the name of Brooks Jensen. Um, I know, yeah, Brooks, yeah, yeah, of course. Brooks. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, my whole thing is to share my vision, share my work, share my images. Now, I don't actually do it for other people. I do it my, for myself. Um, and so in large measure, and this has taken a while to develop, uh, I don't really care what the hell other people think of the work because I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for me. But we are but, still showing it to them, right? Yes. But the act of sharing or showing it to them uh, is, is I find gratifying and motivating um, and yes, you know, I appreciate it when people like the work. I appreciate it when it gets hung in galleries. I appreciate it when it gets selected in uh, uh, contests and stuff. Uh, but that's not really why I do it. Mm. Uh, I do it for myself. And I, I think that in large measure, that's what a photographer or an artist should do is do it for yourself first and foremost. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, if, if people like it and uh, at this stage, I don't have to actually, I don't have to actually work for a living. I'm retired. Although, to be honest, retiring from advertising photography, uh, to a certain extent, I've never worked so hard. You know, I've written books, I've done mm. workshops, I've taught, um, I go out and make a show. I did a, uh, a, uh, a show with a friend of mine from high school. For our 50th high school reunion, I did a pop-up show where I had uh, 40 images. Well, I wasn't going to do that many, but we got a PDF of the gallery, and it's like, well, let's see. If I'm making 14 by 17 prints, that's neat times this, and and it's like, oh, shit, i got to make okay. a whole lot mm -hmm. of prints. Uh, and it was an enormous amount of work, and it was up for two and a half days. And I actually did it for myself and uh, my friend from from uh, high school. I didn't really do it for the people that came through the gallery. So mm -hmm. does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, so where do you think the, uh, uh, I mean, standard cliche question, I mean, but the one that naturally always comes up in this kind of conversations, you know, where do you, because you have, you have seen it all, you know, all those couple of decades, you know, you were, you have seen photography. That's so kind of you, Tomas, a couple of decades. Well, uh, you have 50. seen. I started, started before high school, so over <laughs> 50, five decades. Thank you. Five decades. Wow. Okay. So where, where do you, where do you think, where do you feel? You talk also to many people, you know, in the industry, outside of the industry, artists, uh, software, you know, you, you talk to many people. Where do you think photography is, as we define it in this most, you know, let's say, quote unquote, traditional uh, form where we capture things in front of us, right? On any kind of device. Will it be there in what form and will it be, become more niche? Or niche, you know, what do you think is happening, especially with the AI, you know, uh, rising now and where it will be in 10 or 20 years? What's your feeling? Oh, I have no friggin' clue, Tomas. Like um, you didn't have 30 years ago, right? When you yeah, were no, on? I mean, you know, back when I, well, now when I got that Lemba 14 transparency and put a loop on it, <clears> my immediate thought was, well, this changes everything. I had no preconception of how it was going to be 30, 40 years from then. So I really don't know. I, what's interesting is Gen Z, uh, however you want to mm -hmm. classify that group, um, seems to be discovering silver-based um, <laughs> photography. <laughs> now, the interesting thing is they seem to be shooting film uh, and then scanning it for social media. I mean, they're not spending, some of them are going into the dark room and, you know, revisiting mm. the analog, uh, silver gelatin process. But a lot of them, uh, I had a good friend of mine. I won't mention his name because uh, I don't want to embarrass him. He just was enthralled with 
uh, people like Weston and Ansel Adams and, and, uh, that he was very inter, uh, interested in getting into, um, uh, um, the classical look. I kept telling him, I said, well, if you know what you're doing in Photoshop, you can make anything look like a real photograph. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and so he went out and bought a four by five, uh, Toyo view camera, um, uh, several lenses, a bunch of 4 by 5 film holders, uh, went out and shot 4 by 5 film, processed it in trays, um, uh, you know, the old time, uh, working in total darkness because film, you can't use safe lights. Um, and then, uh, of course, he didn't want to, this was before he decided whether or not he wanted to purchase an enlarger. A 4 by 5 enlarger is, uh, well, it's kind of tough these days. Um, to find, well, you can find a bunch of them used, but, um, uh, so he ended up, uh, uh getting a, uh, using a flatbed scanner and scanning the negatives and, and then bringing them into Photoshop. And I said, so, uh, you know, you've got high res digital cameras. Uh, are you getting anything by scanning? He said, well, I'm getting a lot of dust. <laughs> I said, oh yeah so now you remember what analog photography was like dust spotting mm. uh, but he came to the realization and the conclusion that uh, if you know what you're doing in photoshop you can have uh, uh, apply any kind of look to pretty much any kind of image so uh, he sold off the camera and, and uh, I said, well, you know, take some Photoshop lessons. <laughs> yeah. So, so there, are, there, there are people, you know, who say no matter how, how good, you know, all the, all the digital filters and, you know, looks can be, there are people who, who will tell you, right, that no matter how good it is, but when you scan an analog print from actual, you know, negative or from, even from the positive, you know, you can still see that this was an analog photograph, no matter how, how good those, you know, digital filters are. What do you think? Do you see, would you see it? Did, would you see the difference? Do oh, you see the difference? Yeah. Uh, am I allowed to use the term horseship? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's <laughs> horseship. Um, well, first of all, how are you looking at them? Are you looking at them on a computer display or are you looking at them on a photographic print? Um, you can actually take, uh, and, and Dan Burkholder, a friend of mine, uh, from here in the States, um, platinum, platinum palladium. You can take a digital image, make a, um, film positive and then use that to either make a silver gelatin print or use that to make a, expose a, a platinum palladium print. Um, so, you know, where do you draw the line on what is and isn't digital? Uh, can there not be any pixels ever created? You know, so if you take black and white film and process it, put it into a larger and make black and white prints, okay, yeah, that is pure analog. But if you are doing a hybrid of analog digital technology, where do you draw the line? Hmm. The fact is that uh, and, you know, I've, I used to lead a cr- crew of, uh, pretty good photographers, uh, Greg Gorman, John Paul Campanegro, um, uh, a fellow by the name of Bruce Frazier that wrote a couple of books on Photoshop and, uh, ultimately Andrew Rodney. Uh, we used to do a thing called the Epson Print Academy where we would go around and spend a day, uh, basically, uh, doing seminars on, fine art digital printing. And Matt Colbert um, at, was business partners with Graham Nash from Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. Graham is a very avid photographer and I arguably kind of created the whole digital fine art printing. Um, and I like to say it took a rock star with a hacksaw um, to create fine art printing. He had an iris printer, over a $100,000 printer, that they were trying to load fine art paper on, you know, thick watercolor mm. fine art, and the paper guide kept getting in the way. It would would scrape the paper, 
So he took a hacksaw and took off the paper guide. Um, and then they were making uh, fine art digital prints with iris printers. So we've got a wider range of substrates and mediums than ever before to print on. Uh, anything that can go through a, uh, an ancient printer, uh, or you can do platinum, platinum, palladium. I mean, uh, so why constrain yourself to only uh, think, doing pure yeah. analog? Hmm. Probably, you know, just like we are doing, huh? enjoying all of those different tools, all of different medium and... and uh, well, a couple of years I mean, ago, when my daughter went through, she had graduating college, she ran out of classes to take, but she still needed some more credit hours. So she took, now this was my daughter, I'm a professional photographer, um, uh, she took a photo 101 class. They gave her a camera, a Vivitar camera, a horrible camera, and, and told her to buy a certain kind of Ilford film. And they had a dark room that they taught her how to load on Nikkor reels and, and uh, process the film and then make contact prints and um, put it in the enlarger and make enlarged prints. And so she hated the community dark room where other people, you know, just. Mm. Uh, so she said, Dad, can I please, please, please use your dark room? So I had to clean out all the computer boxes out of my darkroom. So I spent time, well, I, that's where I put it. Uh, uh -huh. I spent time with her and time that I really cherish and enjoy. Uh, we would go around and photograph and then I, all right, I will tell you that I never could get her to properly load film on an Icor reel. Have you ever tried doing that? No. Okay, so <laughs> if you don't, I mean, you've got to put it in the right way, you put a crank and then load it. If you don't, you get emulsion um, uh, smears and, and you get screwed mm -hmm. up film. So I would load the reels for her because I could and she couldn't. But she would hand process the film in, in tanks, uh, make contact prints under the enlarger and then make enlarged prints. Uh, and it was funny because uh, her photography instructor here in Chicago um, was curious. She said, now, you know, he said something to the effect, of, um, are, do you have a relative that is a um, uh, well-known photographer here in town? She said, oh, my dad, uh, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. So he was mildly in intimidated by me. Um, but, and then I remember why I kind of hate the darkroom. It stinks in there. You know, the, the hypo stinks, the mm -hmm. working in the dark. You know, I can work, watch TV, listen to music, uh, work it in front of the computer. There's no stinks, um, you know, so. That, apparently, the, apparently the new chemi the new, you know, the chemicals, they don't stink that much anymore. I have a good friend here in, he has his own dark room. And by the way, I was just, he just pushed a, 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 a you know, analog film and Nikon or Nikon FM2, I guess. Yeah, something like this. I had one of those. Pushed one of those like a couple of days ago into my hands. So I was walking with, around yeah. with this thing now and I'm... Cute kind of little looking, thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's, you know, that it's kind of really looking forward you know, to the results. He will develop the roles for me and so on. Anyway, exciting times, but they have always been this way, right, Jeff? All, all, all over those years, there's so much going on, uh, changing. Uh, what is your personal plans for, for the you know, upcoming years? Do you, any projects, particular ones you would really want to, to accomplish, to, to finish? Um, <laughs> so I'm 69 and uh, I'm going back to school. <laughs> well, not, not officially to school, but um, I'm choosing to take workshops with people whose work I find engaging to absorb and find out more about how they work, to compare and contrast with how I want to work. Um, a couple of years ago, I took a workshop out in um, the Palm Springs Photo Festival. I took a workshop from Stephen Wilkes and from Jay Maisel. Now, Stephen used to be Jay Maisel's <laughs> photo assistant, <clears throat> and Stephen did a movie, Jay Myself, a movie about Jay Mizell, 
uh, and I've known them since the mm, late 80s. Um, but the prospect of actually spending four days in a workshop with them, that was great fun. Um, mm. Now, um, they gave me a lot of shit, uh, which I thoroughly deserved. Um, this October, I'm taking another um, Palm Springs workshop, um, going out to Palm Springs, and um, I'm taking a workshop from Dwayne Michaels. You know who Dwayne Michaels is? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, look him up, and you'll okay. be impressed, because in addition to Jerry Ulsman, mm -hmm. in terms of photo composition, uh, uh, Dwayne Michaels is probably the other most influential photographer uh, in my college days. Um, Dwayne Michaels' work is, is very much a storytelling, sometimes a sequence of images, not just a single image. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it would have motion blur or subject blur in the image. Uh, and uh, uh, and then next March, I'm going out to Monterey uh, to do a workshop with actually a bunch of guys I don't know, but we're going to be doing four uh, days worth of workshops in Big Sur and along the Monterey coast out in the classic California photography. Uh, I, I took another workshop uh, a, a year or so ago with a lady by the name of Karen Pasillas and Elizabeth Opalenik. Those people that are familiar with American fine art photographers will recognize those names. And one of the cool things was uh, we got to go uh, have lunch and hang out at uh, with Kim Weston at the Wildcat Ranch mm. uh, out in Carmel, Edward Weston's uh, mm. um, uh, house. Uh, and I have fallen in love with, uh, I've, I've now reading several biographies about uh, Edward Weston. So what I'm doing uh to advance my craft is is educate myself with um, on some of the people that have gone before me, like Edward Weston. I had to study him in in college. You know, I went to um, a place called uh, Rochester Institute of Technology (RIT) um, and a very good photo school, um, and um, so we had to study the history of photography. Uh, but I, it never, you know, his son, he had uh, three sons, but two of them became photographers, Brett Weston and Cole Weston, and now Kim Weston and Kim's son, Zach, is into photography. So it's like multiple generations mm. of photography in one family. Um, that's almost no. cheating, right? No. <laughs> no, but I mean, th th that's the way, this best possible way, nicest way to, you know, always stay yeah exactly stay hungry you know always learning always always acquiring new ideas new yeah. kind of and, tips, and you know. making prints uh, the thing that i've got um uh, in fact six of the uh cactus tin types are hanging in a gallery um uh southeast center for photography in uh in south or north carolina they're going to kill me for not remembering um, but anyway, they're currently hanging in a gallery. Um, I've got a couple of other images hanging uh, in uh, um, A. Smith, Amanda Smith Gallery. Uh, so nice. mm -hmm. I'm continuing to enter work now, not so much for the accolades as the exercise of creating folios of work. So they give me a theme. I collect a body of work around that theme, you mm -hmm. know landscapes as a broad scheme, but things like uh, forgotten uh, worlds or water or whatever. Uh -huh. And then it gives me, uh, and I can go through my collection. Yeah. Occasionally I'll shoot something new. Although, uh you know what, I sh my single most photographed subject uh, since before the, pa uh, just after the pandemic, my daughter's cat, Phoebe. Uh, because the cat, in fact, she was down here. I don't know if you heard her. I heard something moving around. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. She was down here <laughs> meowing because, uh, but I was going to have her jump up. She didn't, but she even has her own face, uh, hashtag on Facebook. Okay. Hashtag, yeah. We'll make sure to, okay. Yeah, 
hashtag Phoebe Photos, Phoebe F-O-T-O-S. And in my Lightroom catalog, I've got her keyworded Phoebe. And there are 7,000 images of my... <laughs> of, of okay, you showed a lot, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are you still working? Are you still in touch with Adobe these days yes. on the on the what they are you know working on? Yes, and in fact, uh, um, I know the um, one of the product managers on Firefly, the generative well, it's the the generative fill that is the AI assisted image generation that now has been incorporated into Photoshop, uh, and um, also. Um, uh, Thomas Knoll and Eric Chan that do things with uh, Camera Raw and Lightroom. I'm still doing uh, Photoshop and Lightroom beta testing mm -hmm. uh, and Camera Raw testing, but I'm, uh, I try to keep it to the, the raw processing component, Camera Raw and Lightroom. Mm -hmm. uh, Photoshop has gotten so big, I don't know how to use most of it. Yeah, when when you meet peop, people, you know, from from this industry, from those companies, kind of, do you feel there is this um, balance, you know, and understanding uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, protecting, for, for the lack of the better word, you know, of of what the traditional photography approach is, and you know, balancing it out with all these new technologies, is there still a group of people that care about the original image and so on? you know, uh, on those company boards and so on, you know, all those developing new features? Um, yeah, so the the fact is people like Thomas Knoll, <clears throat> the people that are involved in the engineering of these applications, they really do care. And Thomas, uh, historically, has always wanted to do the right thing. Um, and doing the right thing for photography as he saw it. And um, now, product management and marketing, um, you know, I, I two things that I used to say about Photoshop. Uh, Tomas, do you know why Photoshop is so successful? Well, there's a couple of reasons, but I don't know what you have in mind. Oh, no. now. <laughs> Maybe the most reason that Photoshop is so successful. You're going to laugh when you hear it. They were the first ones? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, I'll just tell you. The reason that Photoshop is successful is reality sucks, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Photoshop allows you to alter reality. And, <clears throat> you know, humans like being in control, and that's actually one of the reasons that I think Photoshop is so successful is that you could take reality and bend it to your wishes. Uh, and then the other thing that I say about Photoshop is Photoshop uh, is successful uh, in spite of Adobe, not because of Adobe. Uh, and the, the reason I say that is that uh, it was a technology that was waiting to happen. Now, Photoshop was not the first digital imaging app. It just ended up being the best one. Um, and, you know, it ended up mm. on the top of the heap. But the fact is that um, uh, Adobe was built on vector type and illustrator art. Um, and, and Photoshop, Adobe uh, bought Photoshop really for the purposes of being able to manipulate pixels that were rendered from vector art. That's why Adobe got into mm, Photoshop. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, the fact that that uh, people find it compelling, and now you know some people just like to do dodge burn, uh, you know traditional things that you do in the darkroom, and that's perfectly fine and honorable. And some people like mm. me like to mix it up a bit, um, and then yeah. you know some people will find the generative fill. Uh, the Firefly oh. AI in Photoshop. Now, the thing that the distinguish the the Adobe implementation of AI as opposed to I won't mention the actual companies, but the other two or three companies that are out there doing it. Um, Firefly is trained on um, um, uh, um, 
what is the copyright term for um, uh, open on to the public domain uh, image? So um, Firefly is trained on public domain, which basically means that there are it's past its copyright um, um, ID, uh, and they're also trained on Adobe stock. So they are Adobe stock, uh, Adobe has uh, stock photography that you can license. And so part of the deal with Adobe stock is... Uh, um, uh, they can analyze the images, right? Yeah. Mm. So those are the images that are being trained, used for training Firefly compared to the others that are just going out and hoovering the entire internet. And the legal cases are yet to fall. I know of a couple of cases that are in the works uh, because it goes beyond what is called fair use. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the U.S. Copyright Office has already said that uh, an AI cannot have a copyright. Also, they said that um, um, monkeys can't have a copyright. You remember a couple of years ago, yeah. a photographer a, handed yeah. a monkey and then some... Um, um, uh, animal rights people mm -hmm. wanted the monkey to have the copyright and the copyright office says, no, it's got to be a human. And so I think that's an important distinction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but this, uh, you know, Adobe is, is trying to do the right thing. Um, there are a couple of levels of Adobe stock uh, and one is the premium stock and they will allow photographers to opt out of the AI training. Yeah, and, and also the great thing is I heard Adobe and, uh, with, you know, together with a couple of other big companies are actually already involved themselves into developing this kind of, uh, uh, you know, whatever it will be called, you know, the digital watermark or whatever kind of indicator that will be telling us in the future that the image has been generated or has been captured with a camera. Yeah. It's so, extremely uh, important, I think, right? Be, just a punch it it is the content authentic authenticity oh. initiative uh, exactly mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can put the url uh, up for that yeah I where will. basically they want to be able i i think it's important for people to be, look at an image and know the context and the provenance of where that image came from um you know for frame you don't want ai stuff in the magazine yeah Fine. yeah um, the, but pro 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 problematic a bit, you know, raises a, a little bit when, when we are dealing with, with again, mixed kind of images where yeah. the few elements are, you know, AI generated and, you know, placed on top of the, of the actual photographic capture. But even this would be then hopefully in some way being, you know, uh, denoted. Caught, right. Yeah. And denoted. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And well, uh, yeah. I was just going to say, I think that's the thing. Um, it's not just the context in which it's being used, it's the intent. So if the intent is to portray an AI-generated image as real, that's not really legitimate. You know, if, if what the intent is to show an image and, and have people react to it in, as a creative image of course, that that's was absolutely. synthetic, not authentic uh, so there's a big difference between authenticity yeah, yeah. and synthetic images yeah and intent is the most difficult you know <laughs> part to i guess digitally digitally uh, yeah. you know discover <laughs> yeah. well there's yeah. we have a little thing going on in the united states now yeah a fellow that imagine. Used to be president and whether he had <laughs> criminal intent so, yeah uh, uh, let, let's not get into this yeah jeff no. anyway Fascinating times. You enjoy what you are doing. You know, I, I love it. You are, you're embracing all of those, you know, different. Well, I think we're in the, in the golden age, the ascendancy. There's more photographs taken today than ever before. Um, and, uh, you know, billions a day. Uh, and, uh, crazy the, stuff. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, a few of them are actually good. A few of them are. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have, you know, we have, there's not enough space, you know, on our platform in the magazine to, to show all those amazing images. And, you know, so people are being so creative, you know, what, 
Great times, anyway. And Photoshop is a great tool. And as you said, you just have to find the tools which are, you know, appropriate or, or necessary for what you want to do with your images. And uh, it's great, of course, to have this choice, right? Within one, one, one piece of software. <laughs> Uh, so, Jeff, thank you so much. Amazing. Fast. We could, you know, be talking for hours here. We're over an hour now. Yeah. So, sorry. No problem. It's fascinating conversation. Thank you so much, you know, for, for sharing all your, all your insights, you know, ideas, doubts, whatever it might be. Um, all the best well, with your project. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love photography and I want photography to survive and thrive. Um, um, you know, and I think that, uh, I think it will, it will, uh, it, it will not look the same as it used to be. I think it will. And, and, you know, it, you know, like look at the other technologies, look at the, you know, um, we, I mean, you were listening to music before we started recording, yeah. probably it was digital before you yep. were listening to the long plays, LPs, yep. Yep. the sales are rising again, analog yep. film sales yep. are going up again that, you know. It's usually waves some certain phases when it comes to those things. So I, I'm also, I'm sure photography will be around and printing will be around at least for a while. I'm sure also, you know, and uh, that's what we are enjoying. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jeff. Talk soon. Yeah. Thank we have to uh, get, you know, cut, uh, jump on an update in a year or two and see where we are. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah. Talk soon.